Hey friends, good morning. I hope you have had a great week. I hope school's going well. I hope you had a fabulous Easter. So I am happy that you are joining me again this morning. Now, for the past two weeks, we have taken a break and we've been looking at the Easter story. Well, this morning we're gonna go back and we're gonna go back to our Old Testament study where we left off before Easter. Do you remember who we were studying? Daniel, exactly. We've been working our way through the Old Testament and so we're in Daniel, and remember that Daniel comes between the books of Ezekiel and Hosea. Now, I also want you to think back, and I want you to remember that Daniel was taken from Judah to Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered the city of Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, he was taken away with his friends and numerous other people, and they were captured. Now, so far in our lessons on Daniel, let's think back, we've talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you remember that when they refused to bow down to the golden statue that Nebuchadnezzar had put up, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But do you remember what happened? Did they burn up? No. God was with them and he rescued them. Then we learned about Nebuchadnezzar's dream with Miss Sarah. And you remember he had a very unusual dream about a, a very tall tree that was cut down. And only Daniel was able to tell him what it meant. Well, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that like the tree, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is going to be taken away. But that dream also came with hope. Hope that if Nebuchadnezzar would acknowledge God and praise him and acknowledge him as ruler over everything, his kingdom would be given back to him. Well, a year later, everything seems to be going great. And then Nebuchadnezzar's dream came true. He was out on the palace roof one night and he was saying a lot of pride, prideful things when God suddenly spoke to him. And Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance and his pride led to his humiliation. At that point, he lost his kingdom. He was driven away from the people. He ate grass like the cows. His hair grew long and stringy, and his, his fingernails were like bird claws. But after some time had passed, Nebuchadnezzar completely changed. He looked up to heaven, and he praised God, and he acknowledged God as the king of the heavens. Well, today we're going to pick up and we're going to be looking at a story. I know that you know, but I hope that you'll still listen because it's like we always talk about. We can hear a story over and over, but guys, there is always something for us to learn. There's always something that God can teach us. So today we're going to turn back to Daniel. Now, this story that we're looking at today happened about 600 years before Jesus was born. Babylon is now in a state of decline. It's no longer this powerful empire that it once was because the Persians have now come in and they've taken over Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar is no longer king. They have a new king. His name is Darius. And by now, Daniel is an old man. He's probably in his 80s and he is serving the new king as one of the top three leaders or officials for the kingdom. Now, Daniel was very good at his job. He did a fabulous job working for the king, so much that the king really favored him and liked him. So much so that King Darius actually planned to put him in charge of the entire kingdom of Babylon. Well, can you imagine how the other leaders felt? How would you feel if you had been doing a good job and one person got picked out? Maybe mad, hurt? Frustrated? Angry? What about jealous? These leaders were so jealous of Daniel that they watched for him to mess up. They just waited for Daniel to do something wrong so they could go rat him out to the king. They just wanted to get him into trouble. But Daniel was a good guy. Listen to what Daniel 6, 4 says. It says, Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found 
in him. Guys, could that be said about us? Daniel was faithful. He had no fault. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. What an example for us to try to live up to. Well, let's go back now. The leaders are jealous. They're looking for a way to get Daniel in trouble. And they knew one thing about Daniel. They knew that Daniel obeyed God. And so they made a plan to get rid of Daniel based on what they knew. So they decided to go up to King Darius and they said, King Darius... All of your top officials have decided that you need to pass a new law. And here's the new law. For the next 30 days, everyone in the kingdom needs to pray to you. Well, King Darius agreed. I bet he didn't think much about it before he agreed to it. Immediately, Daniel knew what this meant for him. Daniel immediately knew that this new law would keep him or tell him that he couldn't pray to God. Now, do you really think Daniel's going to listen to this law? Of course not. Daniel still went into his house and he prayed to God three times a day, just like he'd always done. Well, guess what? Those jealous leaders that were looking to get him in trouble, they found out on Daniel. And they went to the king and they told King Darius, Daniel isn't praying to you. He's still praying to God. Well, King Darius was so upset. He didn't want to punish Daniel. Remember, he liked Daniel. And Daniel was going to be the ruler, helper over the entire kingdom. So he began to look for ways maybe he could help Daniel out. Maybe he wouldn't have to punish Daniel. But those leaders... They disliked Daniel so much and they were so jealous and so angry that they told Darius that a law was a law was a law and he had to punish Daniel. So Darius agreed and Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and this is what Darius said, May the God you serve save you. Wow. So here's Darius. He's just thrown someone into the lion's den that he likes. Well, he had a very long night. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He was worried about Daniel the entire night. Wow, I would have been too. Well, the next morning, Darius raced over to the lion's den and he cried out, Daniel, has your God rescued you from the lions? Can you imagine what it must have felt like for Darius while he was waiting for an answer, wondering if Daniel was going to reply and say anything back? I bet there was a moment of silence. And then Daniel said, God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth. I am safe. Well, the king was so happy that God had saved Daniel that he ordered Daniel to be taken immediately out of the lion's den and he wrote a new law. He wrote a law that said everyone must respect God. King Darius wrote this. He is the living God. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So guys, I know we've heard this story a lot. A lot of you would say, oh, Miss Paige, I know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. But we you know one thing that we always do in large group, we always look at a lesson and we say, what can we learn? So we can know a lot of facts. We can know about Daniel and the lions or his friends in the fiery furnace, but what can we learn from this lesson? Well, the first thing is, in the book of Daniel so far, we've seen two rescues, haven't we? We've seen him rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which showed us how when we have bad trials, we need to focus on God, that he's with us in those difficult times. And now, we've seen Daniel rescued from a lion's den, which, wow, it, it just shows God's amazing power. Rescue or the saving of someone, guys, we see it all throughout Scripture, all throughout the Bible. But I also think that it's important for us to understand something. I do think we need to understand that rescue may not happen every single time. Sometimes God is going to ask us to walk through very difficult, hard times. God isn't obligated. He doesn't have to rescue us every single time. Time. And in the times that he doesn't, we have much to learn. And in the times that he does, we have much to learn and much to praise him for. 
But guys, there is a rescue that you can always count on. Always have hope in because it's a promise of God. God has promised that whoever trusts in Jesus will be saved and rescued from sin and death. And so that's a hope. That is something you can always count on. We talked about how God always keeps his promises. Guys, this is one of those promises. I think the other thing that we can learn from this lesson is the importance of prayer. You know, we've had started praying together in large group. You were in your small groups praying everywhere, and you were praying for each other, and you were praying for yourselves and for, for other people. And I love that, and I miss that. I can't wait till we can do that again. But we have been learning about just how important prayer is, and I think Daniel teaches this. See, Daniel had a choice, not only whether to pray and when to pray, but how to pray. So we have a new big picture question this week. And the question is, why do we pray? I want you to think about that for just a moment. Why do you pray? Is it maybe just to get something you want, something you need? Is it to share a hurt, to share a joy, to ask for help? Maybe ask mom and dad why they pray. That would be a great lunchtime conversation. Well, the answer to that big picture question is this. We pray because we trust God and we know that he hears us. Guys, every time you you pray to God, every time you talk to God, he hears you and he cares. There's also a verse I want to share with you out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. And listen to what it says. It says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now let's talk about that for just a minute. Rejoice always. Wow. Rejoice in good times. Rejoice in bad times. Rejoice in the middle of a pandemic. Rejoice that you have a homework. Rejoice in that you can't see your friends, be at church, go to school. Guys, God tells us to rejoice always. But then he says something very interesting. He says, pray constantly. Constantly. How do we pray constantly? I mean, we have to go to school. We have to go to work. We have to do homework. We have to do chores. We have to sleep. So how is that possible? Well, here's what the verse means. The verse is telling us that we need to live a life of prayer. Prayer should just be a part of our everyday life. When something good happens, pray. When something bad happens, pray. When you're anxious, pray. When you're worried, pray. When you're excited, pray. When you have a problem, pray. Guys, he's just telling us throughout the day to talk to him. Don't forget about him. He wants to be a part of your life. And prayer shows that you trust in God, that you're willing to talk to him and tell him the things in your heart. We can trust God with those big things and those little things because you can bring everything to him. He wants to hear it. He cares about you. And because we can trust God, then we can give thanks in everything. We can always find something to be thankful for. Finally, God was Daniel's rock as he chose to honor the Lord, even though he knew he would be punished. Guys, see, Daniel made that decision early on. He knew that he would never compromise his relationship with God. He drew a line in the sand, if you will. Have you drawn a line in the sand? Have you already made up your mind in your heart that if it came down to choosing between fitting in or being comfortable and obeying God, that you would obey God, even if it hurt? See, he was Daniel's salvation. He was Daniel's fortress, his shield, his stronghold when he spent the night in that lion's den. Guys, I can't imagine how scary that would be. Miss Page gets scared of lions at the zoo when they come up and go, "Ah!" Can you imagine spending the night with lions? But God was Daniel's salvation when he came out of that den unharmed. And God showed through his power to rescue Daniel that he can rescue us. See, Daniel's just a small part of a much larger story. And we talk about that. All these stories that we're learning point us 
to Jesus. And God, while he rescued Daniel, ultimately rescues us. He provides a rescue for us from sin and death through his son Jesus. And guys, those things were true for Daniel and they're true for you today. So this afternoon, while you're, maybe while you're having lunch or just hanging out with mom and dad, I want, you to, I want you to talk about three questions as you think over this lesson, okay? Number one, how did Daniel's obedience to God point others to God? Guys, is our behavior, our actions, our words, are we pointing people to God? How did Daniel's behavior point others to God? Number two, is everything in life easy just because we obey God? A lot of people think it should be, but is that what the Bible teaches? And finally, how can you trust God when you're facing something hard? Guys, this is why we do got truth. We have scripture in our heart. I encourage you to read your Bible. These are all things that, that you have some time to be doing, especially right now. So learn and come up with ways that you can trust God when times are hard. Now, before I let you go, we cannot go away without working on our Got Truths verse. Now, if you haven't said your March verse to me, you've still got time. You can post it on Facebook. You can call me, text me, send me a video. I don't care. You've got plenty of time to say it. I'm just was so happy that y'all have been working on them. It's been great to see your, your videos and see your faces. But let's quickly review our new verse for April, which we'll say the first Sunday in May. And remember, we've been working through Old Testament verses, and Miss Page changed it up, and we had this one for Easter. And it says, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. Isn't that a great verse to actually go with Daniel? Righteous and having salvation? God gave Daniel salvation, and he gives us salvation too. So I hope you're working on memorizing this verse. Like I said, you still have plenty of time, and it's so important to hide God's word in your heart. I hope you have a fabulous week. Know that I miss you. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to spend time with you. I can't wait to have a big party with you. So I hope you have a great day, and let me pray for you before we, we get out of here, okay? Dear God, thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the story of Daniel and what you teach us. God, that you are always with us that you provide salvation. Lord, I pray for each boy and girl. Lord, I pray that you will help them to trust you more, to draw close to you. Continue to watch over them and their families. Father, I thank you for each one. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. May everything we do today bring honor and glory to you. In Christ's name, amen. All right, friends, I'll see you next time. Love you. Bye. Hey there, I'm Pastor Brian, and it's time for questions from kids. Aubrey from Phoenix, Arizona asks, A new girl at school wanted me to come over to her house even though her parents were at work. She said I should just tell my mom that her parents were home. I want her to like me. What should I do? You know, Aubrey, that's a really interesting situation that you're in because, man, first of all, it's great that you are reaching out to this new person at school who probably needs to make some friends. Uh, I've been a new kid at school before and I know how hard it is to kind of get situated and, and meet people. And, and so I'm grateful that you are reaching out to her and want to be friends with her. But here's the thing, and I think you know this by the question, it's not right to go over to her house when her parents aren't there and not be honest with your parents. Um, it's never okay to do the wrong thing. And that's really not how you want to set a relationship to start with, is it? You, you really don't want it so that, you know, from the very beginning, she is seeing you lacking integrity in this relationship and doing what's not right. So you have a great opportunity here to take a stand and, and say in a gentle way, but a, a firm way, say, no, that wouldn't be right to do. Let's figure out another way that we can get together and figure out a way that is right for you guys to get together. You know, in the Bible story that we are studying today, we saw that similarly, somebody was put in a position to do what was wrong and he refused to do what was wrong. And one of the things he did was he prayed. Um, and that's another thing that you can do. You can pray to God, ask him to give you the right wisdom on how to converse with your friend about this so that you don't come across pushing her away, making her feel bad about suggesting that. But at the same time, being clear that you need to do what's right and you want to spend time with her, but there's a right way to do that. So here's a question back for you. 
How can God use your faithfulness to him as a way for others to learn about Jesus? 